Let's talk about food, baby. Let's talk about zucchini. Let's talk about all the good foods and the bad foods that may be. Let's talk about food. Come on. <laughs> Told you I was going to sing every single time. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If it's your first time here, I'm Clara and I create Chinese medicine and acupuncture content for practitioners and students, making it easy to grasp and fun to learn. If you found this content of value, I know it's, you haven't seen the content yet, but don't forget to give me a like or even subscribe. That would make my day, thank you. If you are watching the replay right now, uh, the timestamps of this class will be in the description below this video so you can bypass the next few moments where I connect with all the amazing people that showed up live and support me every time. Hi guys, let's just see who's here. Hi guys, <laughs> thank you, awesome. Look at you guys coming from all over the world as usual. I have to say it's the fourth one that I'm doing, the fourth YouTube live that I'm doing and it is sunny. I don't know if you can see the mountains behind me but it is sunny in Vancouver, which is like a miracle. Spring is in the air because every time I've been doing a live, it's been raining. So it's fabulous to see the sun finally. Thank you all for your amazing support. I have to say that before we start, I'm always nervous, you know, like the countdown, the 10 seconds and the nine, eight, and then I'm just feeling my heart palpitating and I get so nervous. And that's the vulnerable part of me that doesn't want to say that. I want to say, oh yeah, this is great. This is easy, but it's not. Every single time I'm still nervous, even though I know you guys are so supportive, so positive. This community has been amazing in the last few years since I've been online. And I always feel like, you know, being vulnerable is always important to show people that it's not that easy. So if you've ever wanted to do some live uh, YouTube or Instagram or Facebook for your own you know, practice and you're scared of it, listen, I'm there every single time. It's not easy at all. But what I know is I know you guys are so supportive. You show up every time. Bonsoir, Lily. And uh, it's, uh, it's always so, so rewarding because I have such a great positive experience every single time. I wish I could see you guys and hear you guys. Obviously, we're not in a Zoom chat, but we got people from Holland, yes, Belgium, third time, Ivy, go for it. We've got people from um, France, of course. We've got people from Canada. I can see people from Scotland. Uh, love that. You guys are always showing up from everywhere, and I'm always so, so thankful for your continuous uh, support. So, Hi, Angela. So it's really, really cool to see everybody. Ireland, of course, Caitlin is here and beautiful Green Island uh, is there in the house as well. So that's really good. Hi, Simona. I love it that you guys are all showing up. I see people, I see constantly that are coming back. And Carola, we got a lot of people from the Netherlands today. It's like, oh, Mark, you're here. Thank you. <laughs> Mark is uh, always showing up as well and you know I love that when you guys can't show up you ask me if you can watch it later like everybody is so polite so given and so I really always want to share and give back so that's why I'm doing those live because I feel like we need connection even though that, you know specifically right now with what's happening in the world hi Elisangela Elisangela made me a smile today uh, yes I need to needle PC6 before I go live to kind of and REN17, I should just keep REN17 needle on my chest and then just, you know, start uh, start the live at that time. Um, Elisangela made me laugh today because she had penciled me down as Clara in her agenda today to uh, not forget to come for the live. So I'm pretty thankful for that. The Isle of Wight. Wow, Lisa, this beautiful place as well. Look at all you people from the UK and all around Europe. So that's great. Uh, we've got lots of people coming in from everywhere and uh, Canadians as well and some from the States and some from all over the world. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Here we go from Poland. Awesome, love it, you guys. Um, I'm so glad you're happy to be here. I'm happy you are here. And uh, hola from Spain. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> thank you for all the capital from Barcelona. Barcelona, my favorite, uh, don't tell my husband, but my favorite uh, football team. Hello, hello, hello. Anyway, uh, <laughs> awesome. And we've got sunny San Diego, 
Jasmine, I love that you are in San Diego, the last place I've traveled to before the pandemic hit us. So that was the last place I went to and I absolutely loved San Diego. My goodness, you are from Nigeria, Dr. Olakin. I absolutely love that we got people from Africa because often this is the continent that, you know, we don't get a lot of people showing up because of course there's a time difference, uh, but the interest is not always there. So I'm so glad we get people from Morocco now and Tunisia and Algeria and Nigeria and South Africa. This is great that this continent continent is really starting to embrace uh, learning more about Chinese medicine. So I absolutely am happy about this. So now that we have connected, let's talk about food <laughs> and see what we're going to talk about today, right? Because that's the whole point is to be here and uh, talk about food. So you're welcome to, hi Leah from Belgium, you are welcome to ask questions. Um, I do my best because I'm doing this all by myself. There's no technology or people helping me. So I do my best to try to Stay focused, but also read your comments. So if I miss your question, I am so sorry. I try to uh, do both, but sometimes I get distracted. <laughs> we need our own natural medicine school in, our, in Nigeria. Yes, you are correct. Yeah, that would be awesome uh, to start this. You can start it there as well. So, um, okay, Nika, you came. Awesome, Nika is so sweet. We have communicated many times. Hi, Nika. And she is from the Philippines and she was trying to get my book uh, for quite a long time and trying to figure out how to do this because she is so far away, but it worked out. So thank you, Nika Nice, because I know that's what you use on Facebook. <laughs> Remember you very much. Okay, you guys, so let's start up. Thank you, thank you again for all showing up. So uh, now that we have seen and said hello to everyone, I want to talk about what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about the digestive system in TCM. How does that differ from the Western anatomy and the Western digestive system? And we're going to compare a little bit uh, the way we look at it. We're going to look at the basic concepts of TCM nutrition and then food properties. I this is a very big subject, right? TCM nutrition, or often called uh, food cures, is a very big concept. So uh, because of that, uh, I cannot go through everything. There's no way I can go through the whole thing. So um, it's important for me to kind of get to the point, to talk about the main concept, because otherwise I'd be here for like seven hours. So <laughs> uh, hi from Brazil. And then Angela goes, oh, that's so cute. I got your book, super love it. And I'm super recommended to everyone. Best book ever. Okay, I have to put that up because uh, you made my day, Angela. I know you've been waiting for the book for a while because she ordered it and it kind of got lost with the delivery people and she didn't get it for Christmas. So I'm so glad you finally got it. So thank you. You're my girl across the water for me in Victoria. So I love that. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, I'm just gonna, oh, I'm just gonna put that off so I can continue to talk about what's happening. So we're gonna start with the digestive system and digestion in a TCM uh, perspective, okay? So let's start with that. So in a TCM perspective, the digestive system is called Zhongqi, that's Z-H-O-N-G. And it's the chi or the energy that is allowing food to be transformed into nutrients and to be transported all over the body for our energy, for basically continuing to live, right? We need food and drinks in order and air in order to continue to live. So the zhong qi or the middle qi, that's really what it's called. Zhong means middle in Chinese. So and don't quote me on my Chinese pronunciation because my Mandarin is not good at all. And it's, uh, but anyway, Zhong Qi is the middle Qi. So it's the spleen and stomach perspective in TCM. So spleen system, stomach system, and it is in the middle. And really, if you look at it, your digestive system physically, it is the middle of your being, right? Between your head and your toes, it is in the middle. So having said that, it is at the center, because Zhong means center, middle. It is at the center of our whole health. So in Chinese medicine, we say that, you know, digestive system, absorbing, digesting, and extracting nutrients to be able to utilize them for our health is literally at the center of everything. So it's funny because digestion and, 
and diet. And di when I talk about the word diet, I want everybody to understand I'm not talking about dieting as in trying to lose weight or, you know, I'm talking diet means what you're eating. You're eating food, the food you're eating, okay? So I want to make sure that diet in this contest today is literally nutrition, okay? So I want to make sure we understand that and we're, we're connecting on that. So when I talk to my patients, I always say the digestive system is at the center of our health. And a lot of people say, well, if it was that easy, if I just have to change my diet to feel better, it'd be easy, like, but it's not that easy, right? The problem is compliancy, and if you've practiced for you know, many years as I have, you know that compliancy is the hardest part in Chinese medicine. So you can tell your patients and tell them, okay, you need to eat this way, and you need to eat that way, and you need to change this eating habits, and etc. It's not that easy because people have had habits of eating for many, many, many years, and there's emotional attachment to it. There's a lot that is, there's habits to it, right? So it's not easy to change. But when the person actually follows your advice in changing the diet, the outcome is fantastic because it is at the center of our health. When I was younger, my mom used to say all the time, she used to say, without our health, we have nothing. Right. And I remember when I was eight years old, I was like, oh, but we have no money and I don't have, you know, I don't, I, we don't go on holiday and we can't go out and we can't buy anything. That sucks. And she would say, doesn't matter. As long as we have our health, we don't need the money. And I remember thinking that makes no sense. But of course, your mother knows best and she is right. Without our health, we have nothing. We can have millions, but if we're not healthy, how are we going to enjoy anything? Right. So that's the wisdom for my amazing mother. But in Chinese medicine, we say, TCM nutrition or the middle jaw is at the center of our health. It affects our brain, our, our emotions. If we feel anxious all the time, it could be due to many reasons. But one of the reasons could be that we're missing nutrients to feed the brain. We don't have enough omega-3, omega-6. We don't have enough fatty, good fatty food to feed the brain. And so we don't feel good, right? It affects our, of course, physical body. It affects our energy, our sleep. All this is fascinating to me that people don't put an emphasis on digestion and nutrition because it should be number one, but it is hard to change, right? So Michelle goes, received my book today. Really excited to read it. Oh, thanks, Michelle. I'm so glad you got the book. Yay! What's the name of the book? Is it on Amazon? No, it's not on Amazon, baby. It is uh, on my website. It is below this video. I think I put the link below. Uh, if not, it's on my website, Acupor Academy. There's a PDF version or a uh, book version. So uh, it is uh, called AccuPoints Made Easy. It's all on acupuncture. So it's not on nutrition. There's nothing on nutrition in there. So just wanted to make sure we understand. Uh, Enrique goes, I'm sorry I'm late. I love when you guys apologize. It's awesome. It's all good, baby. You can watch what you missed. Uh, so we've been talking about the nutrition aspect, right? So it is at the center, like I said. And so let's look at first, and I really emphasize on my patient that it's important to address the diet. Now let's talk about TCM concept when it comes to diet. There is basically points that I want to emphasize. Number one, uh, Carola goes, how can you uplift a vegetarian kid? Yin, chicken broth is a no-no. We'll talk about this. So Carola, I'm going to keep that question for after. We're going to talk about food and then I'm going to talk about that, okay? I'll answer your question for sure. So number one when it comes to Chinese medicine is we have to be mindful when we eat. So depending where you live in the world, right, we have to be mindful to where we eat, <laughs> Caitlin goes, hurry up with publishing your next book, Cut Exam in April. I am working on it, girl. I've finished the PDF. I am taking the PDF and reformatting it into uh, to put the hard copy for the hard copy physical book. It has to be reformatted because it's already 460 pages. I need to bring it down to uh, over 120 pages. So that's what I'm doing right now. So it's, it's, it's in the work. I'm almost done. I'm aiming for the end of March. If you're watching this later on, we're talking about Chinese medicine made easy, which is all about foundation and diagnosis with case study. And I also am going to put a intake form that is fillable online so you could fill up and use that intake form with your patients. So I'm putting a lot of great work into it. So it's really super, uh, super exciting. But that's a sidebar. Uh, thank you for mentioning it, though, Caitlin. That's really sweet. So first thing is we have to be mindful when we eat. 
And that's something that I see, you know, especially in North America, people just eat on the go, eat in their car, eat while they're walking, uh, eat in front of their desk at work. Nobody actually sits down and enjoy a meal. Even with family, everybody's on their devices. Nobody's actually chit-chatting, right? So when, of course, I'm an older generation. When we grew up, we came home at the end of the day and we talked about our day while eating. This was very mindful. In France, we love to be social and eat. In a lot of countries, I know in Spain it's the same, and a lot of countries where food and social is very, uh, very big. But nowadays, with everything that's fast, people are not mindful. So if we're not mindful... The food we put in our body will affect us because we're not really being mindful about the energy we're putting in. The second thing is eating in seasons. It's super important to eat in seasons. So having watermelon in the middle of winter, if you live in you know, Canada, that's a big no-no in TCM, right? You want to eat the food that's in season and follow nature way of being. Right? That's what we want to do, trying to follow the nature and the environment we are in, not go against it, follow the energy, ground yourself, be in season. So I always tell that to my patient. The third thing that's important, of course, we want to eat a whole food diet, but that's basic. I don't need to talk about it. If you guys are here, you know eating a whole food diet is all about you know nutrition. We don't want to eat processed food for sure. But the third thing that a lot of us forget sometimes is in North America, because I moved here from France years, years ago, and in, you know, in, in the Americas, from north to south, right? I know there's people from Brazil in here, so um, it is, this is new, right? Those countries, Canada, the States, uh, Central America, like Mexico and Brazil, South America, we are, what, 300 years old? That's it. It's very short, right? And a lot of people keep moving and immigrating to different countries. So the third thing that's part of TCM is, Eating within your cultural DNA, your essence, right? Who are you at the core in maybe the generation back? So, for example, if I have patients that um, are here and they're from Japanese background and their parents moved here. So, the second generation moving to Canada and their parents were from Japan. They were born in Japan, but my patient is born here. But they still have their DNA that's Japanese. Both parents are Japanese. And so... Most people that come from Japan and move here, second generation, even third generation, the body hasn't developed the enzyme to um, absorb and digest dairy because in, Jap in, J in Japanese food and Jap Japan's nutrition and diet, there's no dairy. So they come here and they all are lactose intolerant and they all have issues with digestive system and other issues because it also creates other issues. But they don't make the correlation. I'm like, you know, you've been here, but it's not long enough. So mostly dairy might not be your friend because you're from Japanese descent. It's the same for someone from Germany, for example. German food is, is more blend, right? It's like potatoes and sausage and, and you know, veal, and, but it's not spicy. And so if a person from Germany decides to move to India and they move there, they're probably going to have a lot of digestive issue at first because Indian food is very spicy and their digestive system is not quite up to par and ready for that change, right? So the cultural background of a person makes a huge difference. So the three things is mindful eating and it's season eating and it's cultural background eating. That's really important because we move a lot around the world right now, right? Hi, guys from Israel. That's awesome. <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, and Spain, Guido's here. So those are very important, and we forget to talk about them. This last point I want to make before we start going diving into food themselves is the change of diet. There is no, this is why I love TCM, but why it's tough too. There is no one diet fits all in Chinese medicine, right? So each person has to have a unique nutrition diet that is geared to who they are, where they live, what's their background culturally, so DNA essence-wise, if it's a man or a woman, what their health is at this stage of their life, where they are in their stage of their life. Are they a menopausal woman or are they a teenage boy? Very different diet. And then what's their health in TCM perspective? So you want to make a TCM diagnosis. If a person is blood deficient, they're going to have a very different diet than their sister who may have 
uh, live a fire, right? It would be very different. So when I see the fads of like the keto diet or the paleo diet or the high fat, low carb, high carb, whatever it is, it's like everybody embarks on a fad and they are, oh, oh I'm going to do this because it works for my sister or it works for my neighbor. And I'm like, no, your neighbor and your sisters are not you. So it's important that we have to adapt. What worked for me in my 20s diet-wise is very different what works for me now in my 50s because I'm a very different person. My health is in a different space. I'm a different person. So that's what we want to make sure. We change as we evolve in our health. We can change and adapt. We have to. And that's what TCM is so unique in its way of treating but harder because it's very specific to each person right? What diet is special uh, from North Africa? Oh, <laughs> so diet from North Africa, um, diet from North Africa, most, most North African diets are high in meat, right? Usually um, if you look at Morocco or Algeria or Tunisia or Egypt, there's a lot of uh, lamb, uh, a lot of meat that comes in, a lot of stews like couscous in Morocco. Uh, so there's lots of that, right? So if someone moves to North Africa and they're not used to a lot of meat, they come from a place where it's more veg vegetarian kind of environment, right? Let's say uh, you come from a place that is more vegan or vegetarian, that would make it a bit tougher, right? Because the, the body is not really ready to absorb and digest a lot of meats. So it makes sense, right? So you're never in your 50s, Clara. <laughs> I am in my 50s, Mark, but thank you for the compliment. I'm going to take this one to the bank and remember it forever. Thank you for the compliment. So yes, I'm sure in my 50s, mid 50s coming up. My birthday is this month. So it's climbing, it's climbing, but I'm still having fun. So that's, that's what's good. Okay. So those were the really the, the, the nuggets I wanted to start with. So when you talk to your patients, make sure to really emphasize that you are trying to help them at this stage of their life right now and the diet is specific to them good okay so let's start the presentation here we are la 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 <laughs> so okay you guys so we are like i said that was my introduction let's start about chinese medicine nutrition so we're gonna talk about the basics right first it's a yin versus a yang right yin and yang opposite and then we're going to talk about the five elements because i like i said i can't talk about everything this is just a basic so we're going to have to make it sweet and to the point if i may say uh so what about saudi kuwait more desert yeah so it depends on what you know again saudi arabia and kuwait is very dry the environment you live in is also going to make a difference so it's very dry and it's very hot Right? So in a dry, hot climate, you are able to eat food that is probably more cooling and more moistening, right? Compared to someone that lives, let's say, in, in, um, uh, in Vancouver, <laughs> it's very wet, it rains a lot, and it's cold, right? So it's the opposite of Kuwait or Saudi Arabia, right? So in this instance, if you are in a place like Qatar and you are having a lot of, uh, you're overheated, you want to eat food that is more cooling. So we're going to talk about that right now. So yin and yang food opposite. That's what I try to always explain to my patients. Then we're going to talk about the five elements food and how to use food as medicine because food is medicine. Hippocrates said this thousands of years ago, food is medicine, even though people don't think so, but it is the center of our health. So let's do this. So the first thing I want to talk about is yin and yang food. So Talking about yin and yang food is if someone is very hot all the time, right? They're overheated. They have, um, you know, tendency to wear shorts in winter. They're always kind of hot. They have red face, red tongue, rapid pulse. They have excess yang or excess heat. They will have all the ability to eat more cooling food. So cooling food, as you can see, is food that is more fast growing, uh, like uh, baby food, like uh, lettuce, like baby spinach, right? Anything that's going to grow really quickly. Cucumbers. So those are more fast growing and are more summer food, right? Like watermelon, uh, that is going to be fast grown plant that is more summer food. Raw is definitely more uh, cooling than uh, cooked, right? Uh, 
uh, colors as well. So anything that is green, blue, or purple is much more cooling than something that's more like the sun, right? Like red, orange, that's more warming. And then anything that's sprouting, that's fermenting, that's marinating, that is more cooling than something that you steam or a big stew or you boiled or you sauteed, right? So that's the difference here. So when I talk to patients about someone that's always cold, okay? So if someone is, you know, I always say when I teach my first class every year, first year student, first class, first day, like brand new with TCM, I always ask that question. Raise your hand if you're a coldie and raise your hand if you're a hottie. So right now, can you guys tell me who's a coldie and who's a hottie? <laughs> I know we're all hotties, but if you're a hottie, meaning you're always kind of on the warm side when everybody else is not, if you're a coldie, you're the person that's always bundled up even inside and you're always cold, you have cold hand, cold feet, you're always feeling cold and everybody else is feeling fine, right? So um, that's... That's who we are. So are you guys more coldy in the house or more hotty in the house? Let me know. You can type it. Okay, so we got some coldies in the house. Yeah, if you're born in Israel and you move to Europe, uh, if you're born in Israel where it's nice and warm and you move to Europe, it depends where in Europe, right? If you move to Spain, it's different than if you move to Sweden. <laughs> that is the difference. Okay, we got some coldies in the house. And of course, girls, girls are always more cold than boys uh, in general. So, uh oh, Lily is like, I'm so hot. <laughs> That's awesome. So we got coldy, coldy, lots of coldy girls. Yeah, that's very common, right? And we got some hotties. So, uh, so I was talking about evolution, right? When I was younger, I was definitely more of a coldy. Now I'm in my menopause, Mark, right? And uh, I'm definitely more warm. I'm definitely on the hotter side. So yes, you're like me, okay? You were colder, and now you're getting, you know, younger, and you were hotter when you were younger. And now you're getting colder. I'm the opposite. I was colder, younger, and now I'm hotter because it's the male-female thing, right? So it's kind of interesting. So Jen, uh, for moving from Israel to the Netherlands, then definitely, yes, that is colder and rainy, more rainy weather. So I would watch, uh, you know, uh, your food because you're going to have to keep it really warm. So that's what we we're talking about because you're probably going to get cold quite easily. So for the people that are really cold, I have a lot of patients that come for fertility purposes. And when they come for fertility purposes, the first thing I ask when we go through all the gynecology uh, question and all the reproductive question, the next thing I ask is about diet and what they're eating. And most fertility patients will come in and say, I eat so well, I have a green smoothie every single morning. And I'm like, no! <laughs> so here's the thing. If Someone comes for fertility issue, most of my patients in their 30s or late 20s will feel cold all the time. They're more either young deficient, blood deficient, or they have some kind of stagnation and their um, circulatory system is not working properly. So they get cold hand, cold feet, but they're more on the cold side. And then they have green smoothies in winter in Canada. And I'm like, no. So the idea is green smoothies are great. They're full of nutrients. They're awesome. But they are going to make the person colder. So if someone is hot and it's summer, green smoothies are fantastic. But if someone is cold and all the time and on top of it it's winter, I'm like, you're going to have to step back from the green smoothies because I need to help you with the fertility, but you need to also address the situation. So what I say to people is don't believe anything I say, right? Because you can hear so much information online and you can read so many things, right, about diet for fertility or what you eat for different disorders, I always say, don't listen to what I say. Have a green smoothie and see how you feel the next two hours after that. And most patients will say, oh my God, you're right. I was freezing for two hours after the green smoothie. I'm like, okay. Now instead, have some warm cooked quinoa with some cinnamon and some seeds like sunflower seeds and sesame seeds in there. See how you feel after that. And they're like, oh my God, I wasn't cold that morning. That's the change, okay? We want to look at the yin and yang. That's the first thing we want to look at. Uh, stop speaking so many questions. It's okay, Caesar. It's okay to ask questions. I might not read them all, so that's the problem, right? So I won't have the. the I won't be able to read them all. So, uh, <laughs> so that's why, right? So yes, Nika, you're in a very warm country. So if you're cold, that helps because you're in a warmer place. I'm from Venice, Italy, to Sydney, Australia. So different. I bet it is. Venice is beautiful. So is Australia. Uh, for sure, you have to adapt to the change, Erica. Right? So. 
So in general, um, when we look at people start with the yin and yang, if someone is too cold, you need to explain that they need to eat warmer food, right? Like cooked food. I call this baby food, right? Like sweet potatoes and, and, and food that is easy to digest. Specifically, if their digestive system is very weak, they have tendency to have loose stools or diarrhea or they have very weak digestive system. Don't put more pressure in the digestive system. Start with what I call baby food. So uh, yams, sweet potatoes, cooked apples, cooked pears, salmon, fish, because fish is easy to digest because it's almost brittle, right? It's not like meat. Meat, you got to chew it a lot. So, But it depends which region you are in, right? But what's important is to have like stews, things that are easy to digest, soups, right? Those are really good to have when people have weak digestive systems. So warm the person up. If someone is always hot, on the other hand, then cooling them down is okay, but watch where their environment is. If they're in Canada and it's really cold, we don't want to make them cold. We just want to gently cool them down, right? So in general, if someone is more on the hot side, I would recommend something like, you know, maybe have a salad for lunch, right? Because that's raw food, so that's going to cool you down. Maybe add up more seafood. Seafood is more cooling than meat, for example, right? So we have the hot and cold food that may help as well. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but that's how we start at the beginning. Yes, you guys are still with me? Good. Okay. Like once I tell you, I can talk about this forever. <laughs> Okay, so we talked about the yin and yang of the food, right? Well, let's talk about the dry versus the damp, right? So again, it depends where you live. It depends who you are. But let's say you have more dryness in your body or you have more dampness in your body, right? So people have a lot of dampness. What does it look like? It's excess body fluid, so water retention. It's usually when we have excess dampness, it's excess water and excess grease, right? Water and fat. So let's look at this because body fluid and TCM is jin ye. It's two things. It's the thick fluid and the thin fluid, right? The thick fluid is more the fatty fluid and the thin fluid is more the water fluid. So in perspective of having excess body fluid, we have either too much water or too much grease, too much fat. So how does that look like? Greasy skin, greasy scalp, right? Having a sticky bowel movement. So sticky bowel movement is when you have a bowel movement, it could be loose stool or, or it could be form stool, but you need a lot of toilet paper. That sticky bowel movement, that is excess body fluid and that's part of the thick body fluid. The thin body fluid is having water retention, having a lot of mucus, post-nasal drip, stuffy nose, um, having tendency to cough phlegm even though you're not sick, but you always have to clear your throat. Lots of saliva. You wake up in the morning and you have drools on your pillow. That's too much body fluid. Or for women, a lot of excess vaginal discharge, right? So excess body fluid is or a big, big subject. Deficiency body fluid is easy. It's all dryness, right? Dry hair, dry stool, dry skin, uh, dry eyes, dry mouth, right? Anything that's dry is a deficiency of body fluid. So how do we address that uh, yin and yang, because dryness and dampness are opposite, right? So looking at patients, if patients have a lot of excess body fluid, as you can see on that picture, is we need to take back or take out anything that's going to create more mucus, that's going to create more issue, right? More dampness. So what makes it worse for dampness is dairy product forms more mucus, uh, like especially nasal mucus, so coughing or flammy, right? Uh, sugar. So sugar can create lots of candida, which can create more excess vaginal discharge, which can create a lot of other issues like acne or skin that is not clear. So that is excess in that perspective, right? <laughs> Thank you, Lily. Lily says, excess body fluid, so yummy to explain. You got this. Thank you. So in general, when someone has excess body fluid, we have. I usually have to say, you got to step back from the dairy. And I'm from France. I love cheese, so I understand. It's not an easy thing. But dairy-free diet and sugar-free diet is the first two things we have to step back. Okay? So we're going to pull out what makes the body fluid worse. Then what we do, because of course when you pull things out, you have to put things in, right? You can't just say, well, stop this, stop that, and then what? Like, I have nothing to eat. So usually what we want to do is we want to have food that is astringent. 
that is sour, that is bitter, that dries all that fluid. So the number one is lemon. Lemon water in the morning. Squeeze a real lemon in the water, like some room temperature water or warm water, not cold water, and then drink this on an empty stomach in the morning. It's really good to wake up the gastric juices anyway, but it's really good to dry dampness. So food that is great to dry dampness is usually lemon. Uh, another one that's really good to dry dampness is, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, Granny Smith apple, the green apple. Very good. Dandelion, very good, but dandelion is very cold, so we have to be careful. Asparagus, Really good to be a diuretic, right? They leach water. So this is really good for excess water to have and to add. So we want to add things and then take things away. When it comes to the opposite, because I think in North America, I see a lot more people with excess body fluid than deficiency, right? But some people have, of course, deficiency, right? So if someone is dry, dry eyes, dry stool, dry skin, dry hair, anything is dry and it's chronic, right? We're talking about chronic. I would recommend... The two jin ye, the two fluid in Chinese medicine, right? The thick and the thin. So we need to hydrate with electrolytes like watermelon, cucumbers, uh, food that is high in electrolyte, bone broth, right? Broth, soups, those are great liquid to absorb because they're high in nutrients. And then we want to lubricate, right? We want the thick fluid to be lubricated. So we want a food that is going to be high in great fatty acids, right? So omega-3, uh, specifically like salmon, like avocado, like seeds, nuts, right? Things that it's going to be lubricating and that is healthy fat. So in general, I've had, I had a patient years ago that came in and she's like, I can drink so much water. I drink like three liters a day and my stool is still, still really dry, like pebble, pebble-like dry, you know, like beads, comes out like beads and very hard and dry. So she goes, I don't understand I'm drinking so much water. And I'm like, are you lubricating? Because sometimes it's not liquid you need, but it's lubrication. And she was in her 50s. And if you are or you've ever been around people in their 50s, Skin's dry. Everything starts to dry, right? There's dryness. We lose body fluid as we age. So I'm like, you need to lubricate. You need to add up seeds and nuts and uh, flax seeds oil and add up anything that's going to start to lubricate. And when she started doing this, the bowel movement started to be much better and less dry, hard beads. See, that's simple, right? Yin and yang, hot and cold, dry and damp. Just go from there, and that's perfect. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. I know I haven't had that question, but I get that question in class all the time. What about if I'm dry somewhere and damp somewhere else, right? I've had lots of patients who have, let's say, a lot of post-nasal drip, and maybe they have tendency to have a lot of vaginal discharge, right? But at the same time, they have very dry skin and maybe dry eyes and dry hair. Right? So now we have a combination. That makes it always super hard to treat. Uh, it takes time. It takes more time. And you have to be a little bit more gentle in your approach. And you're going to have to tell your patients to change a few things to start eating really healthy. Right? So the idea is when people have combination that are opposite, the best thing to do is to be gentle in your approach, but to have wholesome food and take all the crap food out. That's the first step to do. Right? Uh, Angela goes, what about inflammatory bowel disease? So that's a specific disease, right? So that's treating the disease. So remember, Angela, that in TCM, we don't treat the disease. We treat the person as a whole, and they have the symptoms that is showing with inflammatory bowel disease, right? So we treat the whole person. So somebody that has that can be blood deficient. Somebody else can have liver fire. Somebody else can have damp heat, liver cheese stagnation. So we have to treat what is the root cause, but also the TCM diagnosis. That's what it's not easy to treat in TCM. Uh, and Diana said, so you say green smoothies for hot people in the winter is okay. No, <laughs> I guess I did not explain that properly. Green smoothies for the hot people is okay in the summer. In the winter, if it's really cold where you live, maybe green smoothie might be pushing it. It might be too much because we don't want to make the person worse, right? Reverse if they're hot. So what I would do is I would have peppermint tea, right? Peppermint is very cooling. Mint is very cooling. So in general, if you have peppermint tea, 
versus ginger tea. Ginger is very warm. I know tea is tea is warm, but the property of the herb that's in it is going to make the change. So peppermint tea is very cooling. So having a bit more cooling food and maybe a salad and, you know, but watch it. If the person is still really hot, maybe have a couple of smoothies, but I would just go very slow specifically in winter. Smoothies should be for summer because in smoothies, green smoothies especially, um, you have to put like greens that are like not growing in winter, like spinach grows in summer, right? Like if you put a cucumber in there or it, unless you put kale, kale is more of a, a fall food. So I would watch that and stay in season. That's my answer to that. I hope that answered that for you, Diana. Thanks, Angela. Awesome. Good. You guys are still with me. Okay. <laughs> hope it's interesting, right? Uh, and if you like it, please, please give me a like and also subscribe so you don't miss out when I come back and do some crazy thing like singing online and be embarrassed, but that's all good. Okay, let's continue. So I was talking about eating in season. Um, so by the way, all the slides that I have here are all on my website. So if you go to my website, acuporkademy.com and you go to the resource page, Underneath the resource page, there's one uh, category that's called Chinese Herbs and Nutrition. And if you click on that, you'll have all those slides there. It's all for free. It's all the information is there. So if you're looking for the slides, they are in there. So they're not lost and you don't have to worry about looking for them. Okay. So spring is in the air for up in the North Hemisphere right now. We have spring coming in the next couple of weeks. Yay! So that's exciting. So Eating in season is really important. So as you can see, spring, of course, is liver, gallbladder element. It's really time to do a cleanse, to cleanse your body from overeating in winter and, you know, overdoing it because most of us, let's face it, when it's winter, especially during this pandemic, if you're watching this, this is 2021 right now and there's still a lot of issues. Uh, but slowly we're coming out of it, which I'm so glad to see for most of us. Uh, and this is getting better and better, which is great for everybody, right? So so the diet in the spring should be more light, right? We should emphasize on young green, like baby carrots, baby spinach, sprout food, like things that are growing, that are shooting off the ground, that are just starting. But again, watch out. If you are a coldie, don't eat a lot of raw food. Maybe use them as soups. Put them in soups or have them in something that's going to be a bit warmer. So watch the cold versus the hot, okay? When summer comes around, it's the best time to have all the colorful vegetables and fruits. So I love summer because it's so colorful. You can have all the, the fruits and all the veggies and all the food that is super pretty to look at when you have a nice fruit salad, for example, right? Um, if you are someone or if you have your patients and they are really cold, even in the summer, I would not have a super cold uh, fruit. So maybe have the fruit sit on the counter. If, uh, if people have yogurt in them, you know, or they like fruit or anything that is more um, cooling, maybe let them sit on the counter for about 10, 15 minutes so it's not as cold because it will create some issue for the stomach and the spleen in TCM perspective. So it's a good idea to kind of let it sit on the counter. If you're someone that hot, then you don't have to worry too much about this, right? So in the summer, we don't want to eat heavy food, right? So we're not going to have a lot of meat, a lot of heavy cheese, a lot of cream. We want to eat more food that is going to be more uh, light. So lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, right? Having things that are not going to be overly taxing on the digestive system and heavy, right? Not big Christmas dinner like people have at Christmas, right? You want to have more light food. Now in the summer, people go out a lot and some people drink alcohol, right? So let's talk about alcohol for a minute because I think a lot of people do drink. If you don't drink, that's great. But if you wanted to know, because patients have questions all the time, right? Hard liquor, like vodka, like gin, is very warming and it's dry. So hard liquor is drying and warming. <laughs> So if you're cold and damp, hmm, I guess what guy it is. <laughs> Not saying you should drink. I'm just telling you if that's part of your cultural country, fun stuff to do on the weekend. Um, wine, depending if it's a dry wine, wine or if it's a sweet wine, right? But in general, wine is damp and warm, right? So the more dry the wine, the more warm it is. The more sweet the wine, the more damp it is. Okay, and then if you look at beer or coolers, all those are very sweet. Beer is made of wheat, so it's very damp. So it, it's not really warm, but it's very damp, so it creates more mucus. So if you're someone who have a lot of dampness, beer might not be your best friend. 
<laughs> so that's something to think about because I know in summer people go to patios and they have a few drinks, etc. Earth element. So earth element is right now. And we say the earth is at the center of everything because, you know, we are self-centered and earth is at the center of the universe, I guess. But the earth element is at the center in that perspective that the digestive, digestive system, sorry, and spleen and stomach is at the center. So what it means is that in between season changes, so right now we are at the earth element until the 20th or 21st of March, we are at the earth element. So right now we're in the earth element. Doesn't matter if you're in the south hemisphere or the north hemisphere, we are in between seasons. So the two weeks of season changes is spleen and stomach time or earth time. It is, if you are sensitive, that depends if your patients are sensitive. So everybody's different. Some people are not sensitive to the barometer pressure or the change of season. I am very sensitive to extreme weather, to change of season. So if you are sensitive to change of season, this is the time to nourish your spleen, right? Because you want to be able to cope with the change because some people get affected by nature and the environment, right? I know I'm one of those. So you want to nourish your spleen. And that's the best time to give a break to the spleen, which means cooked baby food. That's the best thing to tonify the spleen is cooked baby food. So yam, squash, um, anything that's going to be really easy to digest, uh, pumpkin, carrots, adding up um, anything that's going to be, you know, that you can mush, like bone broth is great as well. Anything that's not going to be hard to chew. So not a lot of raw food and definitely not a lot of things like popcorn. Popcorn is very hard to digest, right? Because it can get stuck in the villi of the large intestine. So you want to avoid that kind of stuff. I know a lot of people in North America love popcorn, but you got to really watch if you have digestive issue not to put that in there. So that's what we would do for change of season. Then we have the fall. So the fall, of course, seems so far away now. Uh, fall season, we want to start getting ready for winter. So usually the fall season, we gather, right, apples, and everybody goes and gathers food for the winter. So this is the best time to start fermenting. Fermented food are the best at the fall. And why? Because fermented food are high in probiotics. And so probiotics are the defense system. And the metal is long and large intestine, which are a defense system, right? The Wei Qi, the defensive Qi. So in order to have a strong immune system to go into the flu season or to go into winter season, we want to prepare for that with food that is high in probiotic or defend, defending little men that are going to defend us against the invaders, right? So fermented food are really good. And that's why in most countries, people will can food, right? You can can vegetables, you can can, um, you know, all your fruits, all your vegetables and have them. You can make sauerkraut, uh, you can make yogurt or kefir. You can make anything that is going to be used in the next season. That is probably the best thing to do in the fall is to start having more cinnamon, uh, more ginger, start putting more spices into your digestive system. So that's the fall season in general. Also, we have to remember that in the fall, not everywhere, but in a lot of countries, let's say, that have four seasons, right? Because there's countries that have four seasons, but those seasons are like dry and drier or, you know, like hot and sandstorm, right? Like very different or warm and rainy season, but it's really warm, right? So uh, we have to look at each country. But in countries where there's four very distinguished seasons, the fall is always drier. The leaves are falling from the tree because they dry up, right? So we want to moisten the body in the fall as well, right? We want to moisten the skin as well because the the fall element or the metal element is also related to skin. So we want to make sure that we have a lot of liquid. This is when we start having more liquid. So teas and, and reintroduce um, a lot of teas and a lot of more soups are coming in, right, for the next season, which is the winter season. So the winter season is when we want to keep warm, right? So is lentils okay? Lentils are great. So beans and lentils, Angela, ask about lentils. Beans and lentils and legumes in general uh, are very good to soothe the mind. So they're actually really good for liver cheese stagnation, for stress. They bring the stress down. So for people who are really high stress and liver cheese stagnated, lentils and beans are very good to soothe the liver. So that's a good food. See, we have lentil and then we're so flowing and happy. <laughs> 
So winter season is when we want to have more warm food, spicy food, cooked food, right? This is when we are going to eat food that is going to be nourishing and keep us warm. So you can see in there, um, we can have a bit more sweet food because sweet food is warming like dates and figs. So dry dates, dried figs are very, very sweet, right? In nature, because we're talking about real food here, not like about sugar and cookies, but we're talking about real food. So dates and figs are really good in winter because they're warming and they're sweet and they bring a lot of iron in our diet and lots of nutrients in our diet. So those are great to add and not have a lot of raw food, right? In winter, we shouldn't have a lot of raw foods. That's what I'm saying, like eat in season, right? The dried fruit, we dry them for winter, if you think about it, right? We dry them for the, the winter season when we can't have fruit because fruit doesn't grow if you are in an area where fruit doesn't grow in winter, right? So it depends which area you are in. So hopefully that made sense. So those are the five seasons in TCM and what to do with each of them. So, okay. So I, I wanted to talk about the five flavors because I think that's important to uh, address as well, right? So... If you've done Chinese herbal medicine, we have five flavors, but it's the same for food, herbs or food. The five flavors of TCM are sour, bitter, sweet, salty, and spicy, sometimes called pungent. And each of those flavors are going to add something to the diet and help people address the specific syndrome or issue that they may have. Cheers, I got some water. <laughs> Hi, Paul. Thanks for the happy face. I love it. So um, when it comes to sour flavor, it's obviously related to the liver in the five element and the wood element, liver, gallbladder. But the sour flavor, what it's good about, and I talked about it earlier, is that it's very astringent. So it dries dampness, but more from the inside. It is stringent, right? So it's really good to have like lemon, Granny Smith apple, like I said, rose hip. So rose hip, usually it's in tea. Rose hip is very dry. So if you're someone that's really dry and you have rose hip tea, you might feel like, oh my God, my mouth is so dry, right? So that might be something to think about, right? How do you feel about it? So apple cider vinegar is also uh, very drying. So if there is a lot of mucus, those food are great to dry mucus, right? They're very good in also astringing. So if there's lots of leakage, like diarrhea, excess vaginal discharge that is very watery, if there is uh, seminal emission, if there is uh, lots of excess sweating, any kind of le leakage in, um, in fluids, those foods are going to be your best friend. On the other hand, if someone has tendency to have a lot of constipation and dryness, we got to watch out and not overdo it with those foods. Elisangela says, Brazil, four seasons, summer, 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 and super summer. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I bet in Brazil it's summer, 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 and super summer. Man, that's so funny. I love it. Uh, that's great season. I mean, come on. <laughs> How can you not love that? And the carnival season, right? February is carnival season. You want to talk about that too? That's awesome. Okay, let's look at bitter flavors. So bitter flavors in Chinese medicine is going to be... So sour is astringent. So it brings things in and stops the leakage and the body fluid that's coming out. Bitter is also for dampness, but this one is to dry it or to be a diuretic, right? Bring it out of the body, leach it out of the body or dry the dampness. So that is a bit different. Now, sour food can be uh, more neutral, some are a bit cooling, but they're not really cold. On the other hand, with bitter food, they are drying dampness, but bitter food are also very cooling. So if someone has damp and heat, that is a good food for them, right? Because bitter foods are really good for people that have dampness, but also heat because they're very cooling. So for example, romaine lettuce, asparagus, they're very good at leaching, right? They bring things down and they make you pee it out. So really good for uh, people that have excess edema, right? A lot of edema that will really bring it out, like excess body fluid. Now, on the other hand too, if people have tendency to have inflammation, or an infection. Bitter food are great because they remove the heat and the dampness. So it's really good. Obviously, you might need other things. It doesn't mean that you're just going to eat that. But bitter food, and I'm just giving you an example. There's a lot more 
bit of food than those, but I want to give you a little bit of an idea. Also, bit of food have tendency to bring energy down, the heat down. So for high blood pressure, it's really good as well. And it's good to drain the dampness, right? Leach the dampness out. Um, we have to be careful because they are very drying. So if someone is very dry, probably not a good idea. Dandelion, for example, I know not a lot of countries eat dandelion in a salad. I know in France and a lot of places in Europe, people eat dandelion in the spring as a salad. Uh, it's very cooling and it's very cleansing to the liver. But in general, it's also very, it's a big diuretic and it's really good for inflammation. But if someone is really cold all the time, we have to be careful because dandelion is very cold. Okay. Chamomile. So chamomile tea is very, uh, it's bitter and so it has tendency to dry dampness. So it's really good for people that have excess dampness or excess fluid and it's not super cooling. So it's one food that is not cooling. So if someone has a lot of dampness, you can add up chamomile and not worry about being cold from it. Yes? Okay, you guys, we're doing great. Sweet flavors. Who does not like sweet flavors? So I have to say in Canada and in North America in general and in a lot of countries nowadays, people, food is salty and sweet, right? We have to balance the five flavors. We have to have some spicy food. When I was in India, of course, lots of spicy food there, but also lots of sweet food there as well, right? So, uh, but in North America, the main flavors are sweet and salty. Basically, that's what people crave, salt or sweet, right? And unfortunately, we're not balancing enough with bitter food and sour food and spicy food, right? unless you go out and have some spicy food. So having um, a balance of all the five flavors is very important in keeping the health of the person, right? So balancing food and flavors is important. We can't just have sweet food or just salty food. We need to balance all the five flavors. So sweet food, like beans and lentils, like Angela asked me earlier, are really good to bring the tension and the stress down. Like I said to you, it's great for liver cheese stagnation, all that, ah, makes you feel all calm. Almonds are the same. Almonds are great to kind of Ah, bring this nervous tension down, the, the, the tightness, right? The stress that a lot of people are feeling. So sweet flavors are great to harmonize the digestive system, allow the digestive system to properly function. Specifically cooked carrot, cooked yam, those are really good for that. It builds fluid. So sweet flavors have tendency to be the opposite of uh, bitter flavor. So bitter and sour have tendency to dry the dampness. Sweet food is really good for people that are very dry because it generates fluid, right? So sweet foods are great for people that have dryness. It'll bring the fluid back in. So that's why things like figs, figs are very sweet, but they will bring more generating fluid, which will be really good for people who are very dry. So I see older patients, and when I'm talking about older, not older as in my 50s, but older, 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 older than me, uh, patients that are in their 80s, for example, and I always see their skin is dry and their dry bowel movement and they're very thin. So I always say, you know, have a little bit more, you know, sweet food, and I'm not talking about cookies, but having more like, you know, lentils and bean stews and having cooked, uh, I love chilies, right? You could have like, one of my favorite things to give patients, I have recipes that I give patients is like having coconut milk, which is also really good to bring some fluid into the body or generate fluid. Coconut milk, yams, cut of course, uh, kidney beans, black beans, put a bunch of vegetables, any kind of vegetables you like, like green peppers and mushrooms and any kind of vegetables, mix it up and then put whatever spice you want. So I like to put red curry in there because I like red curry because uh, it's spicy a little bit. You don't have to make it super spicy. You can put whatever, but it's really nourishing. It's really nourishing to the yin. So if someone is very dry, you want to give them more building their fluid food. Yes? So now, on the other hand, if someone is very damp, you got to watch on that because that's going to create more dampness, right? So um, if the person is having, let's say, a chili like we were talking about or they're having a stew, if the person is having a lot of lentils and beans and things that are more sweet and they have tendency to have a lot of dampness, you can balance it up by putting spices that are drying. So we're going to talk about drying spices in a minute. And here we are. That was a good segue for that one. <laughs> uh, so spicy flavors in Chinese medicine are going to be, most spice, 
spices, sorry, are going to be warm, right? Uh, we have some cooling spices like peppermint, like spearmint. We have some cooling spices, fair enough. Uh, but most spices are going to be warm. Kind of like bitter food, we're mostly cooling. Spices, we're mostly warming. So, you know, cayenne pepper, jalapenos, peppers, garlic, onion, cinnamon, ginger, all those are very warm spices. When I was in India, I had chai tea every day, masala chai tea, which was so good. And it had cardamom and ginger and cinnamon and all nutmeg. All those are very warm. So when someone is really cold or specifically when your patient has bad blood circulation, right? They have tendency to have cold hand, cold feet. They have blood stagnation or liver tea stagnation. Their circulation is not good. Spices are the best because they move circulation. They really get the flow going, right? So this is really good for blood stasis, for stagnation, for pain. That's why ginger is great for anti-inflammatory, right? Or turmeric. Turmeric is great for anti-inflammation because they move. They release the blood stasis in TCM perspective. So spices are great to move blood. Also, so they're great for pain in general. Also, what they're good for is most spices are going to be great for uh, the common cold, right? Ginger tea in the common cold, very good to help when someone has a common cold, right? It's going to help. It is really, really good to also increase energy, right? Because spices give you that circulatory. So you're like, woo, I got that energy. I got the spices in my life, right? Life is full of spice. <laughs> you got to keep it spicy. So, but think of this as something that's moving circulation. That's why I like to use it a lot for patients, uh, specifically if there's lots of pain. You can use it by eating it or even externally, right? There's other options. We have to watch because spicy food can be quite warm, right? Most of them. So if someone has a lot of heat sign, don't overdo the spicy. Right. So uh, unless it's like I said at the beginning, if it's in your cultural DNA, uh, definitely it's something that your body used to. That's fine. But don't overdo it if you are going to have a lot of heat. If someone has um, stomach heat, right, like acid reflux, heartburn, bad breath, have a lot of stomach heat and you eat garlic, those people are not going to digest garlic very well because garlic is so hot. That's good. Even though garlic is great for us, right? It is not going to work well for that person. So we have to think of this, right? A lot of great food may not work for everybody, depending on where they are in their life and their health at this time. And the last one, but not least, is the salty food. So like I said, most diets are going to be salty and sweet. Um, the salty food, it's not easy to think how what is salty that is healthy, right? Because we're not talking about like salty as in the you know, a burger and fries and whatnot. We're talking about good salty food. So fermented food, usually like pickles, um, have salt in there. That is quite good. Uh, seaweed. So for people that eat sushi or that like to have seaweed soup, like kelp and seaweed, miso soup is also salty. Seafood. So like shrimp and anything from the sea is considered salty as well. So if you have anything from the sea, that's also on the salty side. So we don't have a lot of food that is naturally salty. Um, Himalayan sea salt, um, you know, really good, good sea salt that is not processed, that is also good because it's high in iodine. And iodine is so good specifically for thyroid, right, as you know. Um, and someone asked me, if there is weakness in blood and high acidity in the stomach, what's the best combination of spicy food? So weakness in blood, you mean blood deficiency in TCM? I answered it, okay. And high acidity in the stomach. Yes, you have to watch that. So for example, I'm gonna answer that question in a different way for you, Samurai. I love your name, Samurai Jitsu. Oh, that's what you do, you're Samurai Jitsu, I love it. So I'm just gonna backtrack from the salty food, sorry you guys, but I wanted to, to mention this. When I have pregnant women, most pregnant women, not everybody, on the first trimester, they have tendency to have a morning sickness, right? Nausea, vomiting, not fun for anybody, obviously, and definitely not fun for them. If that person has stomach heat, I would never recommend ginger tea because ginger is so hot. It's going to make the vomiting worse. But if they have, you know, that stomach heat and they have the nausea, then I would recommend more mint tea to soothe the stomach. On the other hand, if someone is nausea, vomiting, and they're always cold and they're like, oh, I just need soup, 
then ginger tea might work very well from them because they're more on the cold side, right? So think of that, ginger tea versus mint tea, both bring the stomach chi down. One is warm, one is cool. So having the right one is the best way to do this, right? Not having the wrong one. So going back to salty food, like I said, there's not a lot of naturally salty food, which is high in iodine, but when you incorporate, it makes a huge difference. So salty food is interesting in its, in its function. It shrinks swelling, it shrinks cyst, it shrinks anything that's hard nodules. So obviously iodine is really good for thyroid, right? So for people that have tendency to have um, thyroid issue like goiter, which we don't see a lot anymore, thankfully. But in general, anything, any growth, iodine is really good to bring that down. So salty food is really good to shrink that excess uh, nodule that is coming up. The second thing is salty food is really good to detoxify. And it's great to bring things down because it's from the water element, right? Kidney is the water element, bladder is the water element. Salty is in the five element corresponding to the water element. So water goes down. So salty food has a tendency to go down, which means it's great for constipation, right? Specifically. So if someone has really bad constipation, you can take a tablespoon of a really good Himalayan sea salt, put it in warm water, stir it and drink it. And then usually within a half an hour, it is going to help flush that constipation. So it's really good into bringing and uh, purging the bowel, I guess. That would be uh, the best thing. Now, we also have to be careful with salty food uh, for people that have high blood pressure, as you can see, or people that have very sluggish or have a lot of dampness symptoms. We're going to have to not overdo it. And like I said, most people are going to have such a sweet and salty diet all the time. It's too bad because that creates more and more issue, right? We want a balanced diet with whole food. We want to have uh, something that is going to balance all five flavors. So uh, <laughs> let me go back in here. So I have to say, I have so much more to say about nutrition and I can go on for hours and hours, but I want to be, you know, mindful of everybody's time because I know it, it's early in the morning or late at night and depending where, you, depending where you are. And of course, it's a beautiful day in here as well and I need to enjoy that as well. So there's so much more I could do and I could do a part two and a part three because there's so much. But I hope you got something out of this session today and really, you know, were able to um, enjoy it. I'm just looking, hold on. Um, there is so much more on my website. So I want you guys to go on Acupro Academy. You go to the resource page. As you can see, there's a resource page. I got tons of stuff in there that complement what we talked about today uh, because, you know, I can't talk about everything. That's the problem, right? I'm not able to talk about everything. But I hope you got the nuggets. Remember to really help your patients where they are. Do your TCM diagnosis. Tell them to be mindful eating in season following a diet that is suitable for them at this time right now for their lifestyle, where they live, right? That's super important. And then start with yin and yang, hot and cold, dry and damp. And then start looking at seasonal and five flavors. That's the basic of TCM uh, nutrition, right? So Caroline goes, oh yeah, you had asked me a question earlier. What for vegetarian kidney eat? kidney or kidney yin, I assume. Um, okay, so let me put that up. So we go back. Okay, so for what for vegetarian? So vegetarian and vegan are two different things, right, Carola? So vegetarian means that you still eat, I assume, dairy product. If there is a kidney yin deficiency, kidney yin is very drying. So having things that is going to nourish the yin, like beans and lentils and avocado are really good, like protein-rich vegetables are going to be really good for kidney yin deficiency. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. Thank you. Fantastic presentation. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, guys. You're awesome. I'm new to this. Thank you. I've learned so much. I'm so glad, Angela, you've learned so much. I know someone had a question. Lily, what is interesting is in the Middle Eastern traditional medicine, mint is hot. No way! Like, so hot in the church. Like, 95 that you say exactly the same in the Middle East. That is so funny because when I was in Morocco, they drink mint tea and that was very cooling to me. That's, you know, because it's hot in Morocco and the mint tea was cooling me. The tea is warm, but the mint itself is very cooling. So that's interesting. See how every perspective is very different. And I wonder what hot means 
Middle Eastern traditional Chinese, uh, traditional medicine versus, you know, um, what hot means for you compared to me, right? Because there's also a degree there. But that's fascinating, Lily. Thank you for sharing that. That's always really interesting. Great class as always. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, I'm going to continue doing some YouTube live. And I really thank you for showing up live. Please subscribe. Leave comments. Share it. Like it. You know. Keep supporting me because I love, love, love to be here with you. And you guys are fantastic. Thank Beth. That's awesome. Barb, thank you, Eva. Thank you, you guys. That's awesome. Yay. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Oh, Michelle, thank you. I love to be brilliant. I am brilliant. <laughs> That's awesome. You guys rock awesome. Oh, muito obrigada, Elisangela. I love it. De nada, my girl. Uh, that's awesome. I love my teaching. You had at least, oh, I like, oh, I gotta read that again. I wish my TCM teacher at least 1% of your bright energy. You're so sweet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, you guys. You guys rock. I love all your support and your comment. And thank you for coming from all over the world. You warm my heart. I'm not going to sing again. But for those of you who missed the singing at the start, here it is again. Let's talk about food, baby. Let's talk about zucchini. Let's talk about all the good foods and the bad foods that may be. Let's talk about food. Uh -huh. <laughs> I figure I finished with some singing because why not? You guys are awesome. Thanks, Jasmine. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Angela. Thanks, Darcia. Nika, nice. Thank you, girl, as well. You guys are the best. I will see you in the next live uh, class, hopefully next month, which will be April already. Oh my God. The pattern differentiation book is coming in March. Yes, I am trying to finish it and to have it my launch uh, by before the end of the month for the pattern differentiation. It's going to be so awesome. I have 463 pages done on the PDF. I'm trying to have also the hard copy ready and that's what's taking me so time so much time so the whole pdf is done and i have the intake form that's coming case studies it's going to be fantastic and if you're watching this after march 2021 the link to this book we're talking about will be below the video i'm sure if i don't forget to put in there i'll have to rewatch it so much information i know i know sometimes i'm like blah, 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 blah. i'm talking so fast so that's great it's gonna be there i'm gonna put the replay and then so everybody can just rewatch it as they go so thank you guys have a fantastic rest of your weekend which is coming up uh, and i shall see you very very soon bye <laughs> bye guys bye simona from latvia bye anna bye dk bye Mathieu. Bye, guys. <laughs> You're awesome. Uh, okay. Let's do this.